Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Chess.com Rapid Rating Climb series. For those of you who are new to the channel, my name is Alex and in this series I essentially play 15 minute plus 10 second rapid games on Chess.com with one goal of trying to reach 2000 ELO but the main goal being to try to explain my thought process as I play so that I can try and educate you who are watching and try and give you some ideas to think about focusing more on like actual concepts rather than pure calculation although calculation is of course part of it and then using the post game analysis to delve a bit deeper into some of the ideas with the help of the computer and the ability to actually play the moves out on the board rather than just saying a bunch of notations and drawing a bunch of arrows for those of you already subscribed firstly thank you so much for the support it's been incredible and secondly Drop a like and comment if you enjoy. With that being said, let's search for a game and let's get into this. All right, we are playing the 1994 rated Kiwi Stoic from New Zealand. And we have played this guy before. I know we've played this guy. I recognize the username. So yeah, that'll be in one of the previous videos of the rating climb in the playlist below. And he plays the Sicilian. If you guys know the channel, you know I'm playing A3. I can't remember whether this guy let us play the actual gambit or not. So he goes D6, which doesn't allow us to play the B4 gambit, uh, which I have a bunch of videos on, and this video will actually be linked to not only the Rapid Rating Climb playlist, but also a playlist containing all my games on the channel in the A3 Sicilian whether the gambit is accepted or declined. So please feel free to check those out if you want to learn more. So this is an interesting opening because we essentially play A3, but after D6, we can't really justify going B4. So as I've explained in previous videos, we have to now justify this A3 pawn move. And the way we're going to do it is by putting a bishop on C4 and giving it a potential hidey hole on A2 right? Also we control b5 which could be useful if black plays some kind of queenside expansion and tries to play b4. So this is the typical setup in the a3 Sicilian where the gambit is declined essentially. Our opponent goes d6 here. Now normally this knight gets developed first or this knight gets developed first. D5 isn't really playable unless our opponent gives us his dark squared bishop, which seems very unlikely. So I think we're just going to go bishop to a2 so that d5 never comes with tempo. Okay, knight c6. This is more into known territory. If this knight was developed, I would be considering bishop g5, but obviously we can't do that because the queen controls that square. So I think h4 makes a lot of sense. Going after the g6 pawn and trying to open up some attacking lines on the king side because whilst this bishop for the moment looks like it's doing a whole lot of nothing very typically in these kind of structures in this opening once some kind of f4 and f5 break gets made or black commits to d5 or we blow open the light squares on the king side these light squares start to get weakened and then this bishop can really come alive and absolutely win the game. And there was this one crazy game we played in the rating climb where I went down a queen. At in Yeah, in this opening, I went down a queen. But my bishop, when it opened up on this diagonal, was just an absolute monster. And we managed to win that game in large part because of this bishop just harassing the enemy king and being able to open up lines on the king side with an h-pawn push. So you can see how ideas overlap and if you've watched the episode, which a lot of you probably have, then you might see some similarities and we'll see how the game plays out. Now my opponent might be considering taking on c3 and going d5. I don't think that's a good idea though. Um, considering he's just put a ton of pawns on light squares, especially. Okay, so... 
knight g to e7. So he now has enough support to play d5, right? If we were to play bishop to g5, he could play f6, which I have had it in a over-the-board rapid game before, which didn't end that well for my opponent. But he can probably just go h6, and I don't want to trade this bishop off. So I think it makes more sense to play the move h5. Now, if h5 and then d5, we could consider taking. We could also consider pushing. And then where's the bishop going? Because if he goes to f6, we could put more pressure with queen to f3. And if this knight moves, then d5 is going to fall, right? And then if h5 and he takes... Then we might be able to play um, bishop g5, f6 will lose to queen takes here I would assume, or at least force his knight to come to g6 with a bad position to follow. So yeah, h5 I think makes a lot of sense. Some of you might be questioning why I'm spending so long on some of the moves that I'm making, and that has been the reason for some catastrophic losses in previous episodes where we've played incredibly well all game but I spent too long explaining my thought process and essentially just got myself into time trouble later on in the game. Don't get me wrong that's not the only reason I've messed up because you know I'm not gonna lie I do just blunder sometimes everyone does um, but you know if if the main goal of the channel was just to win games one it wouldn't be as useful because I'm trying to educate and Two, I guess, actually, it's the same point, really. It it would be a different priority. Like, if I just wanted to win, I'd play by myself in silence. That's not only not entertaining, but it's not useful or valuable or educational. And I assume that's why people are watching, right? So if I do take longer to explain my moves, like H5... Realistically, I could have played it in like 20 seconds. I spent like a minute 30 on it. Because I'm trying to explain what the point of it is. Right? And if I'd have just played h5 and gone, oh, we're going to put some pressure on the king side, you guys would have gone, okay, yeah, pressure on the king side. But what about d5? Or what if he takes? You know, it wouldn't really be explaining stuff properly. But if I play, if I spend a bit longer and then play h5 and explain why I play h5, I feel like it's more useful. Anyway, little rant over. Something I kind of didn't consider was h6 and him taking. And after takes, he could take on e4, and if I take back, then he can trade queens, and my structure is pretty bad. So, if we go h6, and he takes, and we take, and he takes, we don't have to take back, obviously. We could play a move like queen to... Oh no, we can't play that, because the pawn controls that square. What am I on about? So, let's calculate. I want to try and exploit the weak king in this case, if he trades off his dark squared bishop. Is that easy to do? Could just go queen e2. We could go bishop to g5 actually, pin this knight, potentially play bishop to f6. And if he takes, we can take with the pawn. That looks nice. Are there any other options? We could take here. And if takes, we could potentially trade the rooks. And go bishop g5. We could play the move knight g to e2. So that if he takes, we can take back with the knight. Because uh, if knight g to e2 and takes, we don't have to take with the pawn in this case, we can take with the knight and then follow this up with this. I don't know if I'm the biggest fan of that though. Of course we could take the d-pawn, 
but I don't really want to open the e-file. Takes takes. No, then his bishop gets opened up, and I don't want to do that. I don't really want to do that. So... The way that I'm thinking about this is that h takes g6 could be the safe option. And g knight g to e2 could be another safe option. h6 is a more ambitious option. Let's go ambitious. We might be sacrificing a pawn. But I feel like... I feel like it would be very, very dangerous for him to take the knight for the sake of a pawn. Obviously, if he takes the knight and then we take back and then he takes on e4 and we take back and he trades the queens, our pawn structure is kind of ruined and the queens are off the board. So the lack of king safety isn't as big of a deal. We still may have compensation there, but not as much. Whereas if we sack a pawn... And just try to put pressure on his position with the queen still on the board. Then I feel like we have pretty good winning chances. Um, I'm pretty confident in my ability to continue putting pressure on the position. But there's no guarantee he takes this. There's a good chance he believes that that is suicidal. And maybe it is. Maybe it is literally suicidal to take. But then the problem is, where do you put the bishop? Because if you put the bishop back on f8, then I'm going to go bishop to g5, pin the knight, and you've got a lot of issues. If you go bishop to f6, I can probably play queen to f3, and knight to d4 can be met with queen takes bishop, knight c2, king d1, and if you take the rook, then I take your rook, and not a good position. Um, if queen f if bishop f6 queen f3 I mean you could curl up I mean you can't really move this knight to open your queen's defense because then I'm going to take and my queen adds even more pressure queen f3 here might have been a decent move although here then he can just play knight to d4 so no that wouldn't have been good if the queen's going to come to f3, it needs to come to f3 with a threat. And he goes bishop f6. Wow. That's really surprising. Because I thought this was devastating. He can't try any kind of intermezzo because I'm just going to take with a threat on the rook. Queen f3, then if he tries to take, we get the same line except my queen's on f3, which means that if he takes here I can take with the queen and I have all the benefits of my position without sacrificing a pawn I don't see where else the bishop goes or how he defends the bishop I mean obviously he could go to one of these squares maybe he wants to use e5 because I can't play f4 with my queen on f3 but then I just win this pawn And again, queen f3, if the knight tries to jump in to d4, then we just take. Let me just quickly check. Queen f3, bishop e5, if I take, then knight d4. Ah, okay. So maybe if queen f3, bishop e5, because then I'd have to go back to d1. Maybe I play knight to e2. And if he pushes, I might just have to drop this knight back and reroute it. And if he takes, then I can take with the knight. Either way, I don't like the look of his king side. Queen of three looks like the logical move. It really does. Let's do it. Bishop e5 is the only move I can see him playing. 
with the idea that if he had gone there immediately, then I would have played f4. Maybe that's not even that bad, though. But, okay. Let's just play the position. Let's play the position. I'm just trying to figure out what his reasoning is. Because if you can figure out the reasoning for a move, even if a move looks bad, then you might be able to predict what they're going to do in the future. Which is why I'm predicting bishop to e5. Because I'm like, why would you go to f6 first? Maybe he just missed that this was actually a problem. And that it's very difficult to defend the bishop. Okay, he goes to d4, but that takes away the d4 square from the knight. I don't think that's good. Okay, so. The obvious move is just to take this. Knight e5. Then we can... No, then we blunder this. If we want to be calm and collected, we can always play this move. But... I don't know. Bishop to g5 looks good. Pinning the knight. On takes takes, I don't really care about giving up this pawn. Because I feel like I've got way too much initiative. What if we just take? If we take and he takes and we take with the knight, then we're good. At the very least, we're going up a pawn. But if we take and knight to e5, I'm having a bit more of a problem. Because queen f6 doesn't work after knight takes d3 check. So let me just check this line. And if we can't find anything, then bishop g5 should be good. Oh, but this is also nice. I've decided we're playing bishop g5. This is incredibly, incredibly complicated. And I'm not 100% sure, but I need to make a move. And, you know, as much as I can blame my lack of time management in recent episodes on the fact that I'm explaining myself, at the end of the day, I do just need to play faster. So, okay. Sorry, I'm getting messages. I apologize if you can hear the notification. Uh, queen e2 looks good. Just defending everything. Queen g3. No, I'd rather keep an eye on e4 in case he tries this. Again, queen f6 doesn't work because the knight takes d3 check. So yeah, let's just drop the queen back. Now we're looking Oh, no, we're actually not, because again, knight d3. And then takes, and then he just takes the bishop, and he goes up a pawn. f4 might be on the cards. Knight f3 might be on the cards. f4, yeah. f4 then knight f3 might be on the cards. Queenside castle and kingside castle are both options that are available. Very difficult to kick this bishop out as well. Um, that could be an issue for him. And g7 is perennially weak. I'm not really concerned if he ever takes here. Uh, again, even if I end up giving up a pawn, to get rid of his dark squared bishop, like, entirely, seems like a fantastic trade at the cost of a pawn, right? Okay, queen b6. Queen b6. All right, so, put the pressure here. Maybe this in the future, but we could castle. 
to defend B2. I mean, the pressure on F2 is fine because our queen defends it anyway. This doesn't really work, so he takes, and then the knight's going to fall. Bishop B3 doesn't really work because of C4. And then our bishop's going to be forced out. This doesn't really work because of queen to a5. C3. I mean, if he takes, we can take, but that still isn't even that good. I don't think. Queenside castle looks scary. It really does. But... It should be fine. Is there anything better? No, well, I need to defend b2 somehow. I could go rook b1. Because this isn't a move because the rook is defended. I mean, he could try this, but obviously this is a good trade. Yeah, you know, rook b1, I, I quite like that. I quite like that. Because if he ever takes the knight now, then um, he's going to have problems. And if we'd have castled queenside, then this knight would have been kind of pinned to the defense of b2. But now, if he were to take b2 with the bishop, he'd just be self-imposing a pin on, him, on himself. Self-imposing a pin on himself. Okay. He, <laughs> he also can't castle because his knight's hanging. That's a problem. If this bishop gets traded as well, then uh, bishop f6 could be a nasty fork. This is getting better and better. Now, I would love to be able to kick this bishop out, but it is not that easy. Although, this is looking tasty. If he takes us, then just knight takes. Looking at the weak dark squares, looks pretty good to me. And again, this knight is still here, here, knight f5, or knight d5. I still think that should be good though. At the very least, if a move like knight here, we could always play g4. And if a move like knight to, so like pawn takes, knight takes, knight d5, we could always snap it off and then go knight f6. And this can't be played with an attack because he's on, he's in check. And then say king moves, we can just take on d5. And he's not getting a rook to the e-file, because his rooks are still in jail, kind of. His queen will be under attack. I don't love training off my light-squared bishop, but it should be good. And then maybe if we can move this knight, we could also play c3. Although, although if my bishop ends up taking, then um, this pawn is going to be pinned to the rook. So that's worth noting. Because it's going to take me another two moves to castle. Uh, which means that this knight could hang in some scenarios. Or if I play c3, the c pawn could just straight up hang. So okay, that's worth noting. Worth taking into consideration. But he's spending a lot of time right now. Which is good. We're, we're, we're catching back up. A bit. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a tough position. Top position for both sides. By the way, if you've made it this far in the video and you found it enjoyable and educational, then if you're not subscribed, please subscribe so that you get notified when videos get dropped and I can continue to hopefully del deliver value to you guys. 
And if you're already subscribed, hey, thank you very much. I do have a Discord, by the way, which is linked in the description. If you fancy uh, joining that, it's obviously free and everything. It's literally just to connect uh, like chess players who genuinely want to improve. So I feel like that's the kind of people that my channel attracts. So yeah, if you fancy that, then just click the link below. Of course, you don't have to. Just something that some of the viewers wanted like a month or so ago. So I thought, why not? Why the heck not? Okay, we really are catching up on the clock now, which is great news. Great news. And yeah, I think taking might be his best course of action to try and get this knight out. Because um, I don't really want to... I mean, taking back with the pawn might be good. But I don't actually see where my breakthrough is if I do that. Like, it restricts black. But if takes takes and like knight to c6, that kind of looks okay. Like obviously this pawn is putting pressure on his position, but it is keeping my rook out of the game. <sighs> okay. What if we take? What if, what if we play f4? Because I'm looking at this pin once the pieces move off of the um, the e-file. So I need to move quickly. f4, knight c6, takes. If takes, then it's mate. Let's go f4. I think f4 was begging to be played at some point anyway. It's very interesting the way that the dynamic is working over on the queen side with like the bishop and the queen putting pressure on. And then my knight and bishop putting pressure on d5. And then my rook being on b1 in the crossfire. Oh, what was I talking about, mate? This knight is uh, defending. Still a ton of pressure though, right? Take. If he takes, then knight takes. And that looks like game over. If we take and he takes and then we take, then his queen is under attack and his knight is under attack. That looks like game over. Let's take. He might be wanting f6 to try and kick my bishop out. But if my knight gets here, that's not really going to be playable. If he goes for f6 on this move... And I can just take here. And if he takes my bishop, then we take on d7. This is incredibly complicated. Because we have... This is, um what? The first set of pawns that have been traded. Like, the first pieces that have been traded is on move 15. Like, the thing is, there's 64 squares on a chessboard, right? Each side has 16 pieces. So, 32 in total. As we've been moving our pieces towards the center of the board, it gets quite cramped if none of them get traded, which leads to lots and lots of tactical complications because so many things are going on, which is certainly the case here. Now, what happens if he moves this knight? Firstly, where can the knight go? Knight can't go to d4 because of obvious reasons. Can't go to e5. A5, there's no future anyway. D8, there's no future. Maybe defends E6, though. The knight goes to D8. We could play a simple move like knight F3, just developing, attacking the bishop. Because he can't take because of the pressure on the E-file. But if we take him, then he gets like his knight to E6, and he's a bit more solid. 
we will be up a pawn in that situation, but if he goes for a move like knight to d8, then he can't take us anyway, so this pawn is still preserved, and we can play a move like knight f3. If this bishop comes off the board, it's game over, I believe. Because not only does the bishop put in good pressure on, it's also defending some important squares in his position. And, you know, we have a lot of control of the dark squares right now. Deep within his camp. If he queenside castles to try and get out of this, then d6 will pin the knight to the rook. Yeah, he goes knight d8. So, I understand the reasoning... And if we take, then knight takes, and he's back in the game. But he can't take and leave e6 with no piece on it, because we're going to give him checkmate. So knight f3 looks very nice. If he goes f6 in that position, something we've got to watch out for. And if we take... If he takes, then we take, and we're good. If here, 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 and he takes the bishop... Then we take there, takes, takes, and we have enough defenders. That's worst case scenario. So the thing is, I don't have much time left, right? So I've just calculated the worst case scenario, and it looks great. So I'm going to go for it. I did not calculate knight f5. Okay. Well, I don't think that's that big a deal. Well, if we take his move is obvious. It's not that scary, though. We could give up c2 and play like queen to e5, attacking the rook. g4 is also a move, but then knight g3 or knight e3. If we take here and he goes knight g3 anyway, then queen e5 hits the rook. Very interesting position. Fair play to my opponent for finding this counterplay. Very nice. Let's take. Let's take. I don't believe... Here, I could play queen f2. But this feels very, very nice. Here, here, he's in deep trouble. Yes, I really hope I don't blunder something like I always do. I really hope not. But this position looks so good. Fingers with knight c2, king d2, the knight's under attack and the rook's under attack. And there's no rook on a1 to capture anyway. Even if there was, this would actually be mate. If he goes for a move like rook f8... I might just castle. I might just castle. Rook g8, yeah, same thing. Uh, castling looks pretty nice. Again, I don't want to take because then he can get out of the position a bit. We do have this. Does that blunder anything? Because we're looking at some really, really weak squares. Oh, that has to be winning. Knight e4. Does he have any moves? I don't think so. The dreaded timer, by the way. <laughs> God, what a horrible noise. Knight e4. What's, what can he do? Let's do it. Let's do it. I don't see how he stops our threats. The massive problem is that he can't take because of his pin. And he can't attack my queen either. Because we control c6, where a knight could attack us from. Uh, d6 and c7 are controlled, so we can't try and trade with a queen. f6 is not playable, because we have so much control over that square. This is looking like a potential mate. 
coming in the next few moves. I probably, like, Castling might have been a very safe move to play, right? But I but Knight C2 isn't scary. Um, maybe if you walk out like this and allow a move like C4 check, then it is. But if Knight C2, King D2, worst case scenario, we pick up the Knight. And he tries some shenanigans over like this, and we just tuck our king away. Or play a move like b3 even. Wow, this is shaping up to be an incredible game if we can just hold our nerve. Which is a lot to ask for from me, <laughs> let me tell you. We also have ideas of knight to f6, and if the king moves we take here and win the queen. And if knight f6, king e7, we can take the rook with double check. Or we can play this. And if he moves the king, then we take on here and win the queen. And if he takes with the queen, then there's more problems. Okay, queen a5 gets out of these coming with check, I guess. c3 just looks logical. Blocking the diagonal. Am I missing anything? I don't think so. Knight c2, king d2. Or if knight c2, we can just run this way. King d2 looks good though. Knight's under attack. Got all kind of threat, all kinds of threats. And now, because he doesn't win the c2 pawn with knight c2 check, then we get c3 in, and c3 blocks this diagonal forever, supported by four different pieces. Okay, that's a move, I suppose. There's no threat with it. He is prolonging the game, to be fair. I think this is the most accurate way to do this. And then we're going to promote. We could have played f h7 immediately, to be fair. But uh, this is just as winning. Or it should be anyway. If he doesn't take, then something like this, and he's just getting himself into a mess again. Wow. Oh my god, my voice cracked so badly then. That's when you know it's authentic content, because I'm not I'm not editing that out or anything. <laughs> like you know that's staying in the video. Damn. Okay, the redemption arc begins. And of all the openings, the A3 Sicilian is the one to do it. That was a fantastic game. Um, how accurate it is, I actually don't know. But I've got a feeling it's pretty good. Let's get into the post-game analysis. I hope you guys enjoyed the live game. Like I say, drop subscribe if you haven't. And um, let's get into the review. Alright, so 84.5% accuracy for myself. 65.7 for my opponent. I wouldn't take the accuracies with all that much consideration because, like I was explaining, with like no pieces traded and tactics flying everywhere, pawn tension everywhere, there's going to be a ton of mistakes made because there's no way you can just calculate everything that's going on because there's just so many things happening at once, right? Anyway e4, c5, a3. Like I said, check out the playlist below if you want to see what happens if black allows me to play the gambit after moves like e6 and knight c6 allowing b4, trying to give up the b4 pawn. But he doesn't. He goes d6, knight c3, g6. g6 and d6 are very common moves against this setup, and it's considered the refutation, actually. Um... I believe this knight c3, knight c6, 
bishop c4, bishop g7, d3. I believe this is considered the reputation <clears throat> of the a3 Sicilian. I use those words in big quotation marks because, I mean, sure, the computer says black has an advantage, but prove it, you know? This is looking scary. These ideas are looking potentially dangerous. I probably win more of these positions than I lose, um, even though it should be beneficial to black. So my opponent plays a twist on that uh, with bishop g7 and d3, e6. And I've said this in the Vienna many times, and because the a3 Sicilian no gambit line resembles the Vienna like massively, right? A big part is controlling the d5 square. But unlike in the Vienna, where a where e5 and knight c6 tend to get played, black here can build up a considerable amount of support for the move d5 because e6 can be played. So that's why I play the move bishop to a2. Not only to you can also go to b3, but I prefer going to a2 normally just because like d5 c4 can pressure the bishop on b3 occasionally. Because you know d5 is probably coming at some point, and you want to try and punish that. So you want to get your bishop out of the way first, because it's not obvious where you want to put the rest of your pieces yet. You kind of wait to see what your opponent wants to do. So knight c6, h4. Apparently this is an inaccuracy, because of knight to f6. I mean, I guess you can't really go h5 because of knight takes, and... You're an absolute madman if you're going to do this. In a blitz or bullet game, maybe I would go for this, but this is kind of mental to do in a rapid game. This would get punished very easily. See, typically, if knight f6 is played like this, then bishop g5 comes with a bit of venom, because the only way to, to break the pin is to do this. And then moves like h4 or like f4 and h3... They're going to break apart the pawn structure on the king side quite easily. So, yeah, I suppose h4, knight f6, and then if bishop g5, you could just play h6, and I don't want to give up my bishop, right? So if knight f6, oh, not f6, if knight f6 here is played, then it's very difficult to stop this move. But you could play a move like knight to f3, so if d5 is played, you can push e5 maybe. Although after knight g4, you lose the pawn in this particular scenario. If you were to go f4 and e5 and d5 and e5, then the position is good for white. But black doesn't have to play d5. He could just castle, and I guess there's too many holes in the king side for white. But again, black does have to prove that. Regardless, we don't go into that line. It's good to know, though. And we have knight g to e7. And yeah, h5 is the logical move to play here. Because again, if you go for bishop g5, then just h6. And I don't want to give my bishop up. I'm going to have to retreat my bishop. And then d5 is coming. So h5 makes a lot of sense. d5 is played. And apparently knight... <laughs> apparently king f1 is a very good move here. Because this doesn't come with check. And if you take... Knight takes... I, I mean... I don't know how this is plus 1.2. I know it's a good position. B6 defending C5. H6... Oh, it controls f6. The bishop can't go to f6. Bishop d4, knight f3. Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't go into that. He goes d5. And we go h6. Now, I was considering taking. But I wasn't a massive fan of this. Because, like I said, it was a very safe option. And I felt it didn't really offer all that much. Um, There was also the move... What was it? Knight g to e2, which I considered. But... Yeah, this is unambitious, and d4 is frustrating because the knight's going to have to drop back to the b1. It's not the end of the world because the knight's going to get back into the game. Black can take space with moves like b5, or even just play 
bishop d7 and just develop, right? You could argue for the move e5, but personally I would like to see this because I want to play moves like f4 or c3 to break apart the pawn chain. I guess c3 is better here, but you understand my point. Also opens up my bishop, right? So, yeah, knight g to e2 isn't great. h6, again, like I said, knight f3 and king f1 are the best moves. No one's playing king f1. And on knight f3, I didn't want to go into this. Apparently knight g5. And if you take queen f3... can't castle because then you're getting slaughtered i assume you just take here oh, i can do that first actually yeah but you're gonna lose very very quickly so okay if knight f3 is played you can't i mean you can take on e4 but it's losing yeah i guess the dark squares are just way too weak and it's better just to play moves like b5 or d4 but i would love to see d4 because these are the kind of things you want to get if you're trying to attack someone you want that you want the center to be shot this center is very shot and then not only is your bishop open but this bishop's open and your pieces are transferring to the king side and this pawn is already up here getting this rook into the game this is crushing it says plus 0.9 but i would evaluate it far higher than that from a practical standpoint anyway so, okay, I understand, but uh, h6 is the third best move, and the best move for black is to take on c3. But this is just horrible. If you take on e4 and I take back, then I don't like this position for white at all, and the computer agrees with me. I was going to play queen to e2, I believe. Apparently this is good. But okay, we still have some pressure, right? Better here is to go bishop g5. Oh no, I swear I considered bishop g5. I was between these moves anyway, but bishop g5 maintains a small advantage for white. And the thing is, um, wow, computer wants to give up two pawns like this. The thing is, right, if you have... Or it wants to take and go bishop f6. Sorry, I'll get back to what I was saying in a second. Knight g5. Yeah, this is pretty aggressive looking, but I don't know if I would trade the queens. My point is, you're a pawn down, but the evaluation is slightly in your favor. So positionally, you are plus one because you've given up a point's worth of material to be in this position. And these are the kinds of games that I love to play because I play so many wacky opening gambits with white that essentially lead to an equal position, but dynamically you have so many good chances. And I, I love these kind of positions for that, for that exact reason. And I think they're one of the best ways to actually improve your chess because if you're forced to make aggressive, dynamic, attacking moves, calculating tactics, positional binds like you know all the weak dart squares in this position for example i feel like you're going to learn so much more than just trying to hoard material and it's something that i am like guilty of doing sometimes for sure um but i feel like it's probably a great way to improve your chess regardless he goes bishop to f6 here we go queen f3 which i think is a great move now if he'd have gone bishop to e5 then f4 isn't even that good because then you take here and go into this line again the computer wants this knight to f3 idea and if you were to take 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 then knight to g5 which makes sense in hindsight but the thing is if you were to play f4 here i highly doubt black would actually take it would take a lot of guts to admit you're wrong and that you should have taken on the previous move instead of going to e5 first, right? 
human psychology plays a massive part in chess. So even if the objective best move is to take here, you could have done that on the last turn, right? Unless you're arguing f4 is actually a weakness. But no, f3 is the best here, like I said. And then if this, 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 then you go knight to g5. The bishop retreats back to f6 because queen f3 is no longer playable. Computer just wants you to develop. Taking here would be bad because of knight takes. And I, like, like, like I said, in several scenarios, I'd be more than happy to give up this pawn. Rook b1, where's the bishop going? Going to d4. Knight d6 check. So anyway, we don't go into that. Queen f3, bishop d4. Knight g to e2 is actually the best here. I feel like I considered this, but I why didn't I do this? Ah, I didn't do this because one, I was like, I don't care if he takes, I'm, I'm going to take back with the pawn. And two, I was like, I don't actually want to take the here because then he's going to take. But I guess I maybe have queen f6 in those scenarios because after, let's imagine he plays a move like a6. I was going to do bishop d7, but that would actually cut the king's escape off. Then knight d4, knight d4, queen f6, knight c2, king d1. You can't take the rook because queen h8, king d7, queen h7. And yeah, this pawn is getting through. It's a very alpha zero-esque idea like to push the pawn earlier in the game. And this actually paid off later in the game, right? Like We won partially because of this pawn that was going to get through and promote. Um, even though it, it kind of looks like it's standing around, yeah, it's taking up space, but it's not doing that much. It's kind of just blocking the rook. But if h7 falls, it's getting through. But anyway, we went bishop g5, which is a bit inaccurate, okay. But it's not a bad move. Again, computer really likes king f1, which is so funny. I guess it's anticipating the knight coming into c2 at some point, but odd move. And I guess maybe in some of those cases where um, the knight comes to e5 and sacks itself on d3 if we put a piece on f6, like I was explaining during the game, then if the king's on f1, then taking on d3 doesn't come with a check. Maybe that was part of the idea. Any road. Knight e5, queen e2. Queen g3 was actually better, and I did consider this move, but I decided against it. Now, I know it does set up ideas of bishop 2, f6, but I don't think they even work. Let's say something like this happens. Then you take on d3, and I'm worse. So I don't understand the point of... Oh, I think it's just to put the knight on e2. I think it's more of a clearance thing. Queen e2 is the second best move. But I think he wants to go to g3 to put the knight on e2 to attack the bishop and defend the knight. Because if the knight comes to f3 after we played queen e2, then he can always trade knights. And that's not really good for us, I don't think. Because then the bishop can open up its scope back as, backwards again. Does that make sense? Funnily enough, it's actually best to castle here, which is bold. I mean, knight f3, if you take... Queen takes. We've got a lot of pressure going on. F6 is the best move as well, which is hard to play because, like I said, this diagonal often gets weak as the game goes on and the bishop comes back to life. And here, if F6 is played, E6 is a bit destabilized, which means D5 is a bit destabilized and my bishop could come to life again. So like I was saying, it happens in a lot of these lines. But Queen E2, Bishop B6, sorry, Queen B6, which I thought was odd. Because this knight is just... I mean, I understand the point, right? But this knight is under a lot of pressure now. Uh, and that kind of lost him the game. Queenside castle is a perfectly good move here. But rook b1 is... I don't know why it's calling it inaccurate. It's the second best move. I was very happy with rook b1, though. Um, I thought it was quite a nice move. c4 is the best move here, which I did mention during the game. But I didn't think it would be good in this position. I guess he just wants to cut this bishop off, but mm, I don't know. Rook v1. Again, queenside castling is the best move. 
but it's hard to play like I don't really like ideas of my knight being pinned and b2 being weak it's tough to play bishop d7 and f4 I was very happy with f4 by the way he takes d5 is good but why did I not want to play that ah yeah because I wanted it to come with an attack on the knight because here he can go f6 and counter attack me we take knight d3 queen d3 bishop f6 d6 knight f5 and the position is winning but it's far harder to convert this than the position we got in the game i feel like because here we go f4 force the knight back and yeah the computer just wants to give the knight up so i think f4 is a better move to be honest from a practical standpoint Knight goes back to c6, and then we take on d5, and it comes with an attack on the knight, rather than allowing it. Because here, f6 isn't playable like it was in the other line, because takes, takes, takes. I explained this during the game. And then, we're up a minor piece. Should be an easy win. Maybe not for me, because I always find a way to mess those games up. But, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. This is the, re the start of the redemption arc, anyway. So... Yeah, knight to d8, I predict this move because you can take this, but then knight d5, and um, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know how you plan on getting out of this situation. If queen d8, which I thought was the only way to protect this, apparently c3. Oh, this bishop just has no retreat. Didn't see that, but yeah, bishop's got nowhere to go. So, okay, knight d8, knight f3, which bishop takes e7 is the best move, but yeah, here, again, it's the computer's favourite line. Oh, because we can take like this. Oh, we can go here with a fork. Wait, but what if takes and like queen takes? Oh, then the bishop's protecting it. Ah, blind spot. But, can he not? Oh, he can't, because the rook attacks the queen. Huh, oh, okay. Well, I'll stop criticising the computer, because it just proved me wrong. But knight f3 is still a good move. Still a good move. Knight f5, I mean, it's alright. f6 was the move I was expecting. I, th I think I mentioned this in the game? Yeah, no, I did, I did. Because if knight takes, pawn takes, then... I was, I was just going to take on f6, which isn't the best move, but I think it's the simplest move. If you take here, then I can actually take here of an attack on the queen and then go win the rook. Um, and after this, if you take the bishop, I can just drop the knight back. Or I can take on e6. Or my knight can take on it. I think I was going to play knight takes e6. I think that was in my calculation. And here this should just be completely winning. Up two pawns. His king is massively exposed. Can't castle. Knight takes. No, not that. Pawn takes. Bishop c6. I mean, it's not game over, but it's certainly getting there. You can't queenside castle, though. So the game, I guess it goes on. But three pawns up. I'll f I would find a way to lose this. I just did, apparently. Oh, I have queen f2, which is better. But I'd find a way to lose this game. But he goes knight f5. And uh, we take. Like I said, I did briefly consider g4, but then knight g3. Again, I'm still good, but why allow this? We just take on d4. If he takes with the pawn, which I was half expecting, then I was going to go knight to e4 with the same sorts of ideas as we had in the game. The knight also covers g3, so now g4 could actually be played. But he takes with the knight, attacking our queen, and then queen e5. And this is by far the best move in the position, because it doesn't matter if he takes on c2. King d2, and it's just a fork. I mean, it's not a conventional fork, but we're attacking two pieces at once. So, he goes rook to g8. I was expecting rook f8 to protect the f-pawn and maybe try f6 in the future. But he didn't go for that. 
and we find knight e4, which again is by far the best move. Like I said, I was considering castling. And I mean, we're still winning, but knight e4 is more winning, more clinical. He gives this check. b4 is apparently best. And if you take it, queen d6. Ah, you can't stop mate. I mean, you could do this. Ah, and then I have this. Well, there we go. Anyway, we went c3. I was low on time. b4 is complicated. So c3 is far simpler. Gives the check. King d2. Bishop a4. Knight f6. Apparently, queen d6 was far. It was a quicker checkmate. Oh, I actually just missed checkmating one here. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be a chess centurion video without me just making a stupid one move blunder, would it? We <laughs> go knight takes h7, king e8, knight back to f6, king f8. We again have mate in one, and I don't do it. Um, that's hilarious. We could have gone h7 here as well. Rook h8, bishop h6 led to checkmate. Pawn checkmate would have been cool. There's loads of checkmates everywhere. I missed all of them. I, again, I'm low on time. Should I have found queen d6 mate? Probably, but whatever. A win's a win. If he takes this, oh, again, queen g7 is mate, which I didn't consider. <laughs> I mean, this is also completely winning, and it's mate anyway, but that's so funny. Um, it's, it's so bad as well. It really is bad. You shouldn't take advice from me. Uh, but yeah, he resigns in this position. I mean, he doesn't have to take the knight, but he's got no counterplay anyway. Like I said, my king is very safe behind these pawns. And his king is not safe. So yeah, that's the game. We are hopefully making the climb back up towards 2000. It's been a very long video, I'm aware, but I hope it was very educational and enjoyable. And I'll see you in the next video.